And what we're going to do is it's going to be like Dragon's Den. Each of our three fantastic panellists is going to pitch a trip. Uh, we'd like you all to vote beforehand and afterwards on what sounds most attractive. So if you have the app, um, and we have three choices, Antarctica, uh, Gourmet Food Guide to North Africa, um, or the Med, I think. And um, we're going to go in order, um, and each panellist... Um, ben, are you first? Okay. Great. Would you like to go first? I'd love to. Yeah. Go here. So, good afternoon, and I think it's, it's really exciting to see the interest in the expedition yachting industry. As someone who's been in the industry for, for so long, it's great to see the renewed interest in new companies coming in, new ships being out, uh, Sea Explorer coming this year. It's, it's great to see people realizing that yachts are an incredible platform to have amazing experiences. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what Adam and Jordy have to, to put their spin on it. I think it's going to be three really interesting and very different perspectives. So, when we were thinking about what to talk about for this uh, session, we looked back upon the year that we just had. And so we ran over 50 different yacht expeditions in the last 12 months. And the video clip that I'm about to show you was all from footage shot on each of our expeditions. And we looked at different places we could, we could talk about. And we thought about perhaps our expedition to Madagascar, where there were these you know, wonderfully charismatic and inquisitive lemurs. Or up in Alaska with the glaciers, and the black bears and the old growth forests, and just the, the fun of watching a bear or simply jumping in the water. We're going all the way up to uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, where we take guests up into the highlands or into the Sepik River, and they have this cultural encounters that's so far from the modern world. We looked at Svalbard and above 80 degrees north amongst the glaciers and amongst the wonderful terrain, and of course, there's no better spot anywhere for seeing polar bears. And we looked at real exploration. We took a, a sub to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean for only the third time in history, and we had real discovery. There actually discovered over 40 new species on this expedition alone over the last year. We looked at talking about Greenland and the incredible icebergs in Disco Bay and going up to the ice cap for some heli hiking. And we looked at the Northwest Passage. We had a record three yachts that did the full Northwest Passage transit this year. They experienced the aurora borealis, they saw dramatic fjords, they had polar bears on kills. All of these were different destinations that we thought about, but in the end, we settled on Antarctica. Whether on a sailing yacht, or whether on a really sturdy luxury motor yacht, Antarctica, to me, represents sort of the ultimate super yacht experience. There's just something about the wildlife, about skiing, about being in a kayak all alone in Antarctica that is just out of this world. And for me, Antarctica is, is sort of a personal passion. I've been coming to Antarctica since 2007, every single year. And as someone who lives in Manhattan, in New York City, if I don't get to Antarctica every year, sort of a part of my soul withers and dies. So uh, I was very fortunate to spend two weeks in Antarctica uh, just a couple weeks ago on Legend. And this is going to be basically telling you about an expedition that we literally just ran, that we've just come from. And again, all of these pictures are photos that we've taken uh, from, our, from our own trips. And what are you going to do on an expedition to Antarctica? Of course, everybody wants to see the penguins. They're cute. They're charismatic. And of course, we're going to take you ashore to the penguin colonies. And we're going to surround you with 10 or 20,000 pairs of penguins that are going to be coming up and nibbling at your boots. And you're going to be overwhelmed by the sights and the sounds of the raucous penguin colonies, and also the smell. If you've never smelt a penguin colony, you should probably be very thankful on that. And of course, we're going to go out in tenders and zodiacs and take you for rides along the coast and looking for leopard seals right off the, the boat or through these towering, towering uh, canyons that you find in some of the offshore islands. And of course, all along, you're going to be guided by our team. This is Richard White. I've worked with Richard since 2007. He has this incredible ability to bring the natural history world alive and to make you feel passionate about what you're learning, because immersion and education is a central component of any of our trips. But at the same time, we think that there's a human element to all of our guides, that the only way to really become passionate, to make a connection to these destinations, is through this sort of camaraderie that can be formed on an expedition. So this is Moira. 
tagging out with one of our guests as they were about to go sledding and sliding down a hill in Paradise Harbor. And of course, you're going to see whales. There were whales all over the place. There's only two guarantees I make to, to guests when they're coming to Antarctica. The first is that they're going to see a penguin. And the second is that they're going to see a whale. In this last trip, we uh, sailed into Charlotte Bay. We dropped the Zodiacs. And we spent three and a half hours with, and this is not an exaggeration, 60 humpback whales all around us. There were whales coming up next to the boat, spy hopping. There were whales swimming underneath the Zodiacs. They were just everywhere. It was a remarkable encounter. In fact, I got an email just yesterday from Richard White on another yacht who was in Charlotte Bay, and he wrote to me and he said, great afternoon in Charlotte Bay, hugs and tears all around. It has sort of that ability to make an emotional impact on, on guests. And it's not just humpback whales, it's also killer whales. Uh, on this last trip that I just got back from, we saw killer whales at midnight. We woke all the guests up called all the cabins, got them dressed, went out on deck. They were watching these killer whales coming alongside, turning sideways, looking up at us. And all of a sudden, they sort of disappeared. And we realized that they had all gone to the swim platform, to the stern. And so I ran out, and I'm up on the bow saying, go to the transom, go to the stern. The whales are at the stern. Everybody runs back, and they have 20 minutes with the killer whales this close to the ship, close enough that you could almost touch them. And that's something that's worth getting out of bed for at midnight. But the guests, the, the charterer, really wanted the ultimate expedition. He wanted to have all the toys, all the excitements. And so, of course, we used Legend's uh, Submersible. We ended up taking the guests down 200 meters below the surface. And one of the great things about a submersible anywhere is that you don't know sort of what you're going to find. You're really making new discoveries, whether that's in the Mediterranean, whether that's in Antarctica. And in the uh, trip that, that we did, we ended up seeing a nine meter long jellyfish move past. So there's something pretty cool about that. But the guests wanted more. The guests wanted to do polar diving as well, because apparently the submersible wasn't intense enough. So this is Kelvin. Kelvin's our director of uh, undersea operations. He used to be a diver for British Antarctic Survey, lived in uh, Antarctica for a year and a half at Rothera Base. Kelvin took all of our guests on a year-long polar diving course. He took them to Switzerland, he took them to Iceland, and he got them certified so that on their expedition to Antarctica last month, they were able to do four dives uh, in conditions that perhaps I think I would rather be in the submersible in, but they had a wonderful time. And then, of course, skiing. This was actually inspired by a couple trips that we had run on cloud break a few years ago in Alaska and then later in Antarctica. And we decided we wanted to up the uh, ante a little bit in terms of skiing. So we had a support vessel along on this trip, and we had two helicopters. And with those two helicopters, we were able to offer, for the first time ever, helicopter-assisted <laughs> ski touring in Antarctica off a yacht. And this allowed our guests to be able to go high, high above the crevasses and go high up into the peaks and go skiing. We spent over two years working with the authorities to get permission for this first ever attempt. And it was a great success. This is our guide, uh, one of our ski guides on the left, Mark. Mark is an amazing man. He had uh, kite surfed over 2,000 kilometers across Antarctica. And here he's fist bumping one of the guests. And he said this was one of the coolest skiing runs he had ever done. Because at the top of the, uh, the slope, he looked around. He had a 360 degree view. There were humpback whales all around. And as he's skiing down, the only sound, other than sort of the, the swish of the uh, skis in the snow, were these deep guttural sounds of humpback whales coming up and surfacing that was echoing throughout the bay. And when they got to the shore, right here for this picture, there was seven humpback whales bubble net feeding 100 meters offshore. He said, I've skied across Antarctica, but I've never had an experience like that before. But those are the things you can do in Antarctica, but it's not what really resonates with me. It's not what makes me so passionate about this continent. One of the things that really makes me passionate and that I just love about Antarctica is the light. I love how the light changes as the sun starts to go down and you get this rainbow of colors that comes up and you get more and more distinction and sharpness in some of the, uh, the mountains. And as it goes down further, you might be lucky to get the moon rising just above an iceberg and you start to get a glow on the pack ice. And as the night goes deeper and deeper, you get what I call this Antarctic blue, something that I've never seen anywhere else, this color. 
it's almost electric. It almost sort of has a life to it, and it just shimmers. It's, it's remarkable. And by the end of the night, you have this perfect, calm stillness. And it's remarkable. And the other thing that really compels me about Antarctica, it's, it's not the penguins, because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You've seen the first 10 or 20,000 penguins. You know, you've seen enough. But what's really, really compelling to me is the ice, the variety of colors and shapes and textures that the ice comes in. It's what draws me back year after year. And it might be these small, delicate arches that you see, or it might be these massive tabular bergs that are 50 miles long that are so large it just dwarfs the yacht. And of course, we're going to use Legend's ice-breaking capabilities to its full advantage, going into the pack ice or squeezing between uh, large icebergs or perhaps finding leads in the sea ice to really go exploring. And for me, as an ice pilot, as a captain, the thing that really excites me is getting to take the yacht into this sort of first-year sea ice, where you can have the ship completely surrounded by ice, and you start cruising. And it draws the guests up onto the bow. They're fascinated by it. They want to see what's going on. And they lean over the bow, and they watch the bow crunch and shake and push through the ice. And it's just an experience unlike anything they've had before. And on this trip, when this picture was taken, we spent two days in the ice, completely surrounded like this. We were the furthest, vessels, uh, furthest south vessel on the Antarctic Peninsula at the time, and put the helicopters up, and the guests just wanted to be out there, soaking in the sun, enjoying this view, and enjoying this totally alien landscape. But as I said, Antarctica is a passion. It's a passion to me, it's a passion to all of us in the company. I've only been coming to Antarctica for 13 years. I'm the new guy in the block when it comes to, to everyone at EOS. And because of that, we try to instill the sense of love and interest in conservation to all of our guests. On this most recent trip, we had uh, scientists from Conservation International and uh, another conservation organization, Sea Legacy, on board. And we hosted basically a seminar at sea every day about Antarctica. We had the former head of the Australian Antarctic Division as one of our guides. who could come on board and talk about climate change, talk about the Antarctic Treaty, talk about what needed to be done. On this expedition alone, we raised over several hundred thousand dollars for an organization, and we got funds committed to a scientific expedition for next year that we'll talk about later. Also on the trip was Paul Nicklin. I've known Paul since 2007. Paul is a National Geographic photographer. Maybe you're one of his six million Instagram followers. Paul runs an organization called Sea Legacy. And we had a full team from Sea Legacy on board, and we organized a shot over 8K red camera system that filmed and captured Antarctica using a system that had never been done before down south. We're going to make a movie out of that uh, film, and we're going to send that back uh, and sort of bring the excitement of the polar regions back to those uh, that, can't, that don't have the privilege to come as often as we do. But lastly, to me, what's exciting about Antarctica is the effect that it has on people. Nowhere else have I seen such an effect uh, on individuals. I've seen executives reset from being tied to their cell phone, and I've seen families reset in their relationship to each other. It has this incredible power to sort of remind us of where we are in the galaxy, where we are in the universe, and how lucky we are to get to see Antarctica. So, thank you so much. That, that was brilliant. Um, you've, you've sold me. Now, Jordi uh, from Polaris is gonna take us through Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Eritrea. Thank you very much. I have the impossible task of trying to follow that uh, incredible presentation. Um, well done, Ben. And congratulations on the, on the amount of money you, you've raised on that. Um, we, we love Antarctica um, and, and the polar regions, and I think when, when people think about explorer yachts and yacht expeditions, they think about the polar regions first. What we at Polaris are, are trying to do, and I think with our, with, with our colleagues, uh, in this industry is really broaden it out so we can create new yacht destinations around the world uh, and put the infrastructure in place to, to achieve that. And that's one of the reasons that um, I have chosen to talk about um, this, this region in the Middle East. So we, we operate everywhere. Th these are our hotspots, uh, areas we, we like to, to operate and curate trips. Uh, you'll notice there's not much in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. We are uh, intent on changing the statistic that 80% of yacht activity happens in 20% of the oceans, and all of us here 
our job is really to get yachts to move further afield uh, and, and make it enticing, safe, uh, and interesting. So our mission is to push the boundaries of luxury yacht travel. Our purpose is to transform people's perspective on the world, but also our industry's impact on the planet and the oceans. Uh, and we do this by creating hugely innovative and creative um, uh, projects around the world, and we do it with military planning precision. That, that's our background uh, and, a, and a slight difference between, between all of us. Here's a short video which just, just gives you a flavour of what Polaris gets up to. So I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Eritrea, and you might think these are countries that uh, are associated with risk. Why would you go to a desert environment on a yacht? Uh, and I think it has a lot of, lot of negative connotations, but actually the Red Sea is one of the uh, richest uh, seas we have on the planet, uh, and, and amazingly it's largely unaffected by a lot of the environmental issues happening in other oceans and seas. So just a quick overview on, on the three areas. Saudi Arabia is super interesting at the moment. It's opening its doors to tourism, uh, and it's really trying to encourage people on land, but at sea as well, to, to, to come and visit. Uh, many of you might have been uh, involved with the, the project in Neon uh, last year, which I think had about 30 charter vessels were, were invited to northern Saudi Arabia to house uh, a group of high net worth individuals for an event there. And that's just a, a, a taste of what the, the Saudi government are trying to do on the yacht sector there. Sudan uh, has its political issues. However, the islands and atolls of Sudan have, have been totally unaffected and untouched by everything that happens on land. These uh, are the, yeah, the, some of the richest areas of, of marine life on the planet. Schools of hammerhead sharks, Arabian red sharks, uh, so much to offer, uh, and some of the best diving on the, in the world. And finally, Eritrea, which, which for us at Polaris is, is the gem of the Red Sea. This is a, <clears throat> a country that was at war for 20 years with, with Ethiopia uh, and, last, and in 2018 signed the peace treaty and opened its doors. Uh, and we, we went straight there to recce the, the Lac Islands, 115 uninhabited islands in Archipelago in the Red Sea uh, with, with no fishing, no yachts, nothing else, but lots to offer. So I'm just going to show you another very short video of, of that recce. Scenes straight out of the Caribbean, you might think, or elsewhere. But this is this is pristine. There's no plastic on these beaches. There's uh, so much uh, marine life. Night diving, you're you're sandwiched between a, a bed of uh, jellyfish above you and guitar sharks and red sea sharks beneath you, and nobody knows about it. Hundreds of yachts every spring and every autumn transit through the Red Sea on their way to and from the Mediterranean. And no one stops. So we intend, well, I intend to show you all the, the great things that you could do on a yacht expedition here, and the reasons that the yachts and the captains need to stop and take their owners and the charter clients to this area. As I said, no, there's absolutely no bleaching here, which is amazing. Coral's in really good health. And that, I mean, that looks like it's Indonesia, Komodo. So this is the route that we propose. Uh, flying into Jeddah, we've just come back from a recce there uh, up in Alula. So you'd fly up to the top and, and witness some extraordinary sights up there, which I'll come into a bit more detail now, before cruising down across the Red Sea to Suakin in, in uh, Sudan, and then uh, the, the, the South Sudanese atolls. And then down into the Delac Islands, uh, which is really the highlight, uh, through the highlands of, of Eritrea up into Asmara and flying out. 
So day one, I'll rattle through it because I'm short on time. We're the last, we're the last ones to go. But Jeddah is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's an extraordinary place to, to see anyway and, and it's very yacht friendly. So it's a, it's a good place to start uh, or finish. And from there, you can do an awful lot of things. So if you fly up to Alula, this is, this is the, the Wadi Rum, this is the Petra of Saudi Arabia. And again, really opening up its, its doors. There's so much to see and do here. You can either keep it very high octane for clients, you can have rage buggies, you can have helicopters, or you can keep it a little bit more civilized and have a fleet of old school Land Rovers. Day three, moving across the Red Sea, it's only one night of cruising before you get to Suakin. I don't know if anyone's heard of Suakin before, but it's this extraordinary uh, island that was the, the, the center of trade in the Red Sea hundreds and hundreds of years ago and for a very long time. And the little mounds that you can see are all, are all ruins. They're all essentially rubble of a, of, a, of a city or a town that was built purely out of coral, something which we just couldn't fathom to do today. But, but if you walk around that uh, and explore those ruins, it's an incredible um, thing that, that really hasn't, doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. Game fishing here, the marine life is phenomenal. Grand Trevelli, yellowfin tuna, there's an awful lot to do uh, all the way down the, the Sudanese coast. But really, it's about the atolls. It's about the huge uh, schools of hammerhead sharks uh, and the, the untouched, pristine diving that you experience uh, in this area. Now, the, the, the dive liverboards, there are two or three dive liverboards, and they operated throughout all the political crises and everything else. The coast was left completely untouched, uh, and Port Sudan is, is, is a decent place to, uh, to uh, provision and do a number of other technical aspects. But really, it's, it's about the marine life here. Mantas, hammerheads, uh, and everything else. Also, a key conservation project, trying to um, protect the endangered Arabian Red Sea shark, which I'll come on to a little bit more towards the end. Everything with, with yachting, can, you can call anything a world first these days. EOS have got a great uh, reputation, uh, uh, have been the first ones to do many things over the last 15 years of, of, of operations. But I don't think anyone's done any submersible activity in Eritrea and Sudan, and, and, and it really does need an owner or a charter client to come in and do this, because the research will be invaluable. Why is the coral not bleaching here? It's just one of the many questions that no one can really answer. So, so I think if, if we could try and get a client interested in, in submersible activity in the Red Sea, especially in Eritrea and Sudan, that would be amazing. You can see from the water temperature that it's just, it's just great all year round, but the clarity you, you probably would have noticed in the video, it's not particularly clear. Uh, we went at slightly the wrong time and after a storm. However, normally the visibility is fantastic during spring and autumn. So then we finished in, the, in Eritrea and the Dilak Islands. And as I said, this is, this, this is just phenomenal. 115 islands, which are completely untouched. We didn't see another human being for six days. Didn't see another fishing boat. We didn't see any activity of fishing. We were surrounded by tuna just jumping everywhere. Sites that, that you know, some people in the room would remember from 20, 30 years ago in many seas and oceans, but something we don't really see anymore. So it's a, just, just on the, the level of, and volume of marine life, it's fantastic. But also there's some other amazing things to see. So there's a perfectly preserved World War II Italian destroyer in an inlet to one of the islands where there's, there's very little current, so it's been preserved amazingly, uh, and it's a perfect depth for diving. With special permissions from the government and everything else, you can, you can achieve uh, all, of, all of the things we've, we've listed here. And then to finish it off, you're, you're getting a four by four um, convoy up in, through the highlands of Eritrea, which are very similar to the highlands of Ethiopia. Uh, they're stunning, dramatic, stuck in time. Uh, and then you're met by, by a, a, again, a preserved and opera, op, opera, uh, operable steam train that takes you the final leg into the capital city. This is just one of the pumping stations where, they, where there's a reservoir of water Ditches, it, you know, dumps its water back into the, into the locomotive, which then takes you the rest of the way. It's a pretty cool way to enter a capital city. It's a pretty cool way to cut through mountains. Uh, and then what you'll, you experience at the end is Asmara, which is the capital of Ethiopia, uh, sorry, of Eritrea, which is an Italian colony. So you're, you're hit by an old Fiat garage, Art Deco Fiat garage, and then Baroque cathedrals, uh, amongst other things. So it's, you've, got a, you've got a really interesting blend of culture, scenery, wildlife, starting in, in Saudi Arabia and working your way down all the way into to Eritrea. And these places are, they're safe to go to. You know, the Eritreans, it's a very autocratic rule. Nothing happens 
inside the, the, the territory and the waters of Eritrea without the government knowing about it. So security is paramount. And that actually provides a great opportunity for, for yachts to operate in. We've now built we, uh, many, uh, we had negotiations with seven different ministries and ministers to build the infrastructure for super yachts to come to Misawa, the port in Eritrea. Uh, and it's now there and you know, happy to share that information with anybody so we can encourage more people to go to these places. Uh, but they didn't have, didn't have any idea of how to accommodate a super yacht in, in that port. Uh, so we've basically written the manual for them uh, and negotiated special permissions for the diving, for the submarines, for everything else that would be required uh, for, a, for an explorer yacht to see. Here's just a, a couple of the images, steam train on the, on the left, uh, and, and an amazing t uh, tank park, which is a sort of stark reminder of the, the history of Eritrea, uh, but a very cool thing to take guests around. Uh, and then with all of us, we're all very focused on conservation and it wouldn't be a polaris experience without uh, a conservation project tied to it, which is sort of compulsory for all of our clients. So firstly, I, what I mentioned earlier is the, is the Red Sea uh, shark and, and, and working with a local organization in, um, uh, in that part of the Red Sea. It's, it's a pretty, it's, very, it's completely endangered at the moment. And I think if we're not careful, we'll lose that species of shark. The second one is, uh, a, a project that we've negotiated with the Eritrean government is trying to create the first marine protected area uh, in Eritrea, which will, which will hopefully surround the entire Dilak Islands. And that's to prevent fishing uh, and, and dropping anchors on corals and reefs and, and, and everything else. And so that's a really important and very cost, uh, low cost project for the right owner uh, or client to get involved with. Uh, and then finally, everything we do is carbon negative. So we offset uh, our, the carbon side of, of each yacht expedition through the World Land Trust, and then Polaris matches that uh, to make sure that we're carbon negative on everything that we do. So apologies for the speed of rattling through three amazing countries uh, and, and an area that I thought could be slightly right of arc and not something many of you would have, would have heard much about. Uh, but we feel this is an extraordinary yacht uh, experience, uh, and hopefully we can encourage more people to visit these parts of the Red Sea. Thank you very much. Okay, right, last up. Well, the world's a pretty extraordinary and big place with a lot left to explore. And the latest hot yacht destinations, Cocos Island, we were there earlier this year, diving with schooling hammerheads. Antarctica, it's pretty amazing, Ben, you're right. And of course, French Polynesia, amazing beaches, abundant wildlife, incredible tribal experiences. But the reality check is that every client is different and not everybody is able to go to these remote locations. Our clients, we, we all know our clients and they've got young children, elderly parents, high pressured jobs that mean, means they have tight schedules and find it difficult to take time off. Well, one of our clients came to us earlier this year and said, my kids have got a choir tour in Venice, my wife wants to go shopping in Italy, and we can kind of all relate to those family issues, and by the way, I don't want to compromise on the experience. So we decided to curate an experience for him in the Mediterranean but that didn't lack the adventure. And, and what I think that us as experienced curators do best, where we earn our money, where we add value, is by turning an ordinary destination into something extraordinary. And it's really easy to create lifelong memories in Antarctica or the, the wilds of Alaska, but actually, there's a real skill to creating something memorable in a destination that you wouldn't expect it. And I believe that the experiences that, that we get the most out of are at the times and in the places where we're least ex expecting it. So we set about curating this itinerary by asking one really simple question. What's never been done in the Med before? So we started this trip in the shadow of Stromboli, in full eruption. 
And even just the sound of the lava cracking into the sea was an experience that our family are never going to forget. And we decided to put a submarine, a submersible, at the heart of this expedition. A cruise sub-7. Six passengers and a pilot, fully air-conditioned. I mean, those of you who know the range well will know that that means you don't need any protective equipment. A family can dive to 300 metres just in the clothes they were wearing on deck. A zero refractive index on the glass, so it, it literally feels like there's nothing between you and the, 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 the sea. You literally want to reach out and touch the glass to check that it, it's still there. And what this incredible bit of technology does is allows a family to see an underwater landscape or the marine wildlife in a way that really was only the preserve of scientists and experts and professionals just a few years ago. So, I'm sure you agree that's a pretty stunning location for a dive wherever you are in the world. And our first dive, just around Stromboli, one of nature's incredible curiosities, the fumaroles. Bubbles of CO2 coming up from the seabed. It's like being inside a glass of champagne. And, but how do you really elevate a submarine experience? Well, on one of the dives we did to a Roman wreck, we actually coordinated for a team of marine archaeologists to simultaneously dive to the wreck so that the family wasn't just observing a wreck, they were actually in the action. They were seeing a team of divers examining the cargo, holding up the artifacts so they could see them. It was like they were in a film. And although it was at 120 meters and it, it, it took a lot of technical choreography to get it just right and get the timing perfect. But it was worth it because it changed an ordinary sub-dive into something that the family will never forget, a living, breathing, active experience. And they saw amphora and preserved Roman anchors that had only been seen through the lens of an ROV before. And working on a hunch, we actually helped them discover an entirely new Roman wreck that had never been seen before. And I, and just, I need to pause on that for a second because just seeing a wreck, seeing something that has never been seen in 2,200 years is just such a, an incredible experience that I think it left a very lasting impact on our family. And of course, we all know in this industry that our clients love to be surrounded by experts uh, whether it's in law or insurance or tax, and it's no different on holiday. So we paired them with leading scientists who were studying um, rare corals. On this trip, they found red and black corals, previously thought to be extinct in that part of the Mediterranean. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, black coral isn't actually black. And uh, uh, this, this abundance of algae, which is worryingly prescient for global ocean warming. But the impact, again, of being involved in a, a genuine scientific discovery, a real contribution to science on their family summer holiday, was something that I know will stay with them forever, and especially the children. So that kind of wraps up the marine side of our experience. But, of course, you can't go to Italy without immersing yourself in the, the rich Greek and Roman history. Although history can be a little dry. So we think the best way to make history come alive is literally bringing it to life. And these guys did not hold back. We privatised this arena and our guests took part in a couple of hours of gladiator combat. Worked up a pretty good appetite. And of course, in Italy, it's the food, well, the foodie capital of Europe. But you don't have to have white tablecloths, lobster, truffles. We took our family to a centuries-old farmhouse where they made pizza for lunch. There was flour and water everywhere and fun, and they loved it. And in this day and age, where authenticity is getting scarcer and scarcer, 
The only solution is to give people the real deal. This was the room where our family made their pizzas, with an Italian family that had been making pizzas for generations in that way. So it's that authenticity that makes it, I think. Horse riding, exploring cavernous <coughs> lava tubes with stalagmites and stalactites, and of course, just the simplicity of getting back to nature with a hike. We all know what makes or breaks a trip like this. And of course, it's the kids. Did they relax? Did they give the parents enough time to relax? So we organized a one-day immersive treasure hunt with actors dressed as mafia and spies. Well, they slept well that night. I guess, to sum it up, we know that the most important thing is to make our clients, your clients, want to come back yachting year after year. And we believe the way to do that is take a creative view on every destination, every time. Thank you. That was, all three were absolutely fantastic. I don't really want to spoil them with the audience comments asking about pirates and what happens if the submarine breaks. Um, what do you compare the smell of penguins with? Uh, I, one particular comment I like is thank you. These presentations remind me that my life is boring. Uh, uh, let's go to the final vote. There's amazing vote fixing going on here because according to... Slido, we've had 544 people have voted in the last 20 minutes. Um, and I have to say, I think uh, Polaris is the most honest, and both of you two have got... Uh, sorry, not Polaris is the most... EOS has been the most honest. And I think both Henry Cooks and Polaris have managed to fix it better than anyone else. Um, let me see if I can go live, because I don't try... We're going to have to do this very quickly because of all the cheating going on. Uh, I'm not joking, 400 votes... Uh, and I think it's still working. Um, that's 19 already. Someone has got a lot of private browsers open on their screen. Um, thank you. I don't think we need to worry about the winner. They were all absolutely amazing. You've earned yourselves a drink. Um, if we come out of here and turn left, there's a cocktail, and all of you did a fantastic job, as did all our speakers. Thank you very much, and <laughs> cocktails outside. <laughs>